than a wicked and hip hop. Bad, bad, and a wicked and Okay, I think we can start now. We have, actually have a lot to go through today, and especially uh, we want to show a demo today as well. It's going to start a little bit early. <laughs> so quickly go through the administrative stuff. Uh, so project three is due uh, on uh, Sunday, November the 14th. And very importantly, we have a recitation that is we are going to held on a thir this Thursday at 5 p.m. over Zoom. And I highly encourage everyone to, uh, to attend the recitation because Actually, Andrew and I observed that for many of you already used all your lift days on uh, Project 2, right? So, <laughs> yeah, on Project 3, I mean, unlike Project 2, we have some special policy change and we extend the deadline, etc. On Project 3, we have fixed all the grading policy, the scripts, etc. So we are not extend. And uh, yeah, you should uh, definitely start early and check out this recitation and seek for help early as well, right? We will not extend, and if you go over, I mean, there will be a penalty obviously. So product four, oh, sorry, homework four, again, will be released today and is due a little bit earlier uh, on November the 7th. All right. So again, a little bit uh, advertised on the upcoming database talk that we are uh, organizing. So next Monday, we'll have the, uh, the CEO, I believe, and the co-founder of Pinecone talk to talk about their uh, vector database. Essentially, it's a database uh, system. Actually, there's some noise. Could you, yeah. Uh, essentially, it's a database uh, system designed for uh, machine learning applications, right? Handle, handle vectors, features, etc. And what's interesting is that the uh, presenter, I mean, which is the co-founder of this company, is actually uh, the uh, pre previous head of the Amazon AI lab, right? So it's kind of interesting to see uh, what he got to say next Monday, all right? So get to the content today. Uh, last class, we uh, talked about uh, sort of like the standards on how do we define uh, transactions are, are going to be executed correctly. Right? We talk about uh, serializable transactions, especially we talk about a serial transaction, which means that transactions execute one after each other. Right? That's definitely going to be correct. And then we, talk, we said that we don't really want that to happen always, right? Because in many cases, we want transactions to be executed concurrently, right? So they are more flexible, we get higher hardware utilization, as well as potentially uh, later latency if we can execute them in parallel. So we talk about uh, two uh, different concepts uh, that we can allow for uh, operations in transactions to interleave each other, but then to make sure that uh, they are still correct. And then essentially we talk about two uh, analysis that we can uh, decide uh, whether a schedule of a transaction, uh, of, of a set of transactions would be correct. The first would be a conflict serializable, right? Essentially we can uh, look at the uh, non-conflicting uh, operations in a transaction schedule and flip them around so, and see whether uh, we can eventually uh, put back a schedule of a set of interleaved transactions back to a serial order, right? And if we can succeed on that, that would be uh, the schedule would be called conflict serializable, and that's we, that would be, would we consider uh, the correct transaction schedule. And we talk about a little bit more flexible uh, standard, which called view serializable, right? Allows more uh, sort of execution schedule of transactions, but in practice, it's difficult to achieve right? because essentially we need to understand uh, more semantics of the transactions. All right. And then uh, just to quickly uh, go over this uh, example, right here, let's say we have a transaction T1 that has a read uh, on A, write on A, and read on A. Transaction T2 has a read on A and a write on A. Right? And then one conflict, for example, would just be uh, this uh, write read conflict, right? You would have, we define our conflict when you have uh, two operations happening on two different transactions, but on the same rank card, and at least one of them is a right operation, right? Then would be called a conflict. And that's the things that we are trying to avoid to make the um, schedule of a transaction quote unquote correct, or in other words, serializable, all right? <laughs> so uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. I mean, last class, again, just to emphasize, last class we are talking about kind of a theoretical analysis, right? Just assuming that we know the complete read-write set of different transactions, and we know how things interleave, and we know what aborts, what commit, right? Just assuming we know all those things, then we analyze whether a schedule of the transaction, of a set of transactions, would be valid or not, or in other words, serializable. But that's not really, I mean, in practice, you don't really know those read or write of a transaction in advance, right? because typically just users just issue queries on demand, and you don't really know whether a transaction will be abort or commit either. Right. So in practice, we actually need 
uh, like uh, different algorithms or uh, uh, different uh, implementations to ensure that uh, the transactions that executed in a system don't really have a conflict. And especially uh, when there are aborts, I mean the aborted transaction, the effect of the aborted transaction will not be seen by other transactions as well, right? Especially under the, again, under the circumstance that we don't really know the read-write set of different transactions in advance. And then we don't really know which one abort or which one commit either, right? So, uh, the solution we'll talk about today would be, I mean, as many of you may guess, would be use logs, right? To make sure that the records accessing by transactions are protected, right? So that, uh, there would not be, uh, invalid conflicts. All right? So uh, when we say we use log to protect records, so what would be uh, the most simple thing that we could do, right? For example, uh, here, I'm showing you, you uh, one example, right? We just, uh, I mean, lock and unlock things while we are accessing uh, these records, right? For example, here, we can say, hey, there are transactions T1 and T2, and when uh, T1 needs to access records A, um, it can issue a lock on A, right? <laughs> oh, actually, we're assuming that there would also be a centralized location, actually not assume, I mean, there, in the database system, there would actually be a centralized location of component that would manage all those logs. I say, hey, what are the logs currently out there? Which transaction owns which log? And which transactions are waiting for which log, et cetera. We'll go into details later, but essentially, uh, conceptually, there would be a component in a database system that's in charge of all those uh, locking. And actually, that's something that uh, you guys are going to uh, implement uh, at least uh, complete in, in the last project as well, right? So it's very important. Okay, so here, uh, again, back to this example, transaction A needs to read out write on A, then, I mean, for example, it can just uh, ask logs uh, on record A from the log manager, and the log manager can grant log on A, right? Because nobody has uh, had this log on A before. And then here, I mean, transaction T2 comes along, and then it wants to uh, uh, acquire this uh, lock on the record, but then it got denied, right, because it's already held by transaction. And then it has to wait and wait and wait, and then until later on, transaction and finish, transaction, a, transaction one finishes accessing on record A, it can just release the lock, right? Then it notify the lock manager. Lock manager can now grant this lock on transaction T2. And essentially, transaction T2 finishes, and then uh, it can release the lock, right? So this is the high-level kind of concept that we are going to talk about today. Uh, but this is a very simple example, and we will talk about uh, much more specific algorithms um, in, in, the, in the lecture, right? So uh, to uh, give you a heads up on what we're going to talk about today, we'll talk, talk about the different types of locks at first, right? Talk about the definitions, the terminology, and then we talk about one uh, canonical, a very like used, very widely used uh, algorithm to achieve a concurrency control called the two-phase locking. I mean, with the different locks we talk about. And then we talk about several issues that we need to deal with um, under the uh, algorithm or method of two-phase locking, namely deadlock detection as, as well as uh, prevention. And lastly, uh, we'll give a little bit of heads up on hierarchical locking. And because I want to show a little bit of demo today, so probably we cannot finish hierarchical locking, uh, but I, I want to give you a little bit of heads up and we can continue next class. Just before we start, one important uh, concept and we need to distinguish here is that there are actually two types of uh, things that will pro protect records in the database system, essentially. Uh, this is a little bit different than the definitions you will see, for example, in C++ standard or in operating system classes. Essentially, we will distinguish two types of distinguished uh, protection mechanism called locks and latches, right? The latches, actually, what, uh, are what you have seen before in this class would be uh, the um, protection mechanism on the internal data structures. Uh, of the database system. For example, if you have a beta uh, B plus tree index, right, and if you multiple threads want to access the B plus tree index, then you would protect the records, the nodes, etc., in this uh, data structure uh, that is uh, I mean, internal to the database system, and that would be called latches, right. On the other hand, the concept we are going to talk about today would be called locks, right. And they are essentially, uh, again, protection mechanism, but specifically for transactions. And what they apply on, they are just applying on the actual content in the database, right? Just the, the, the tuples in the table, right? Or the entire database, et cetera. But they are protection mechanism to protect the data content in the system, other than some uh, data structure that is uh, used uh, by the database system uh, internally. Does that make sense? Right. So one is on data on the records tuples, these are logs. The other is on like, uh, 
internal data structure like uh, B, -tab B, -tab B, -tab B plus trees or hash tables, etc. All right. And of course, there are within this uh, category of logs, there are different types that may apply in different modes, different methods, etc. And lastly, there would be a log manager. Let me see it at the bottom. That would be coordinate everything, right? Which would be a component in a database system. So we start with a few uh, definitions of uh, different types of logs. So uh, you probably have seen these uh, similar concepts in, in other classes or even uh, in C++ standard, right? The most, at the most basic level, there will be uh, two types of logs. The first it will be called shared logs. Essentially, uh, these are logs for a read on the records, a read for, for read only on the records, right? So you can have uh, different threads that both share the read log on the same record, uh, but they can only uh, perform reading on the record. And the other would be called exclusive logs, and these logs would allow a write or updates on a, a specific record or object. But on the other hand, as you can imagine, I mean, only one thread can hold this uh, exclusive log. And then this is just uh, this compatibility matrix of these two types of logs, right? One read only, uh, the other allow writes. Okay, one called shared and one called exclusive. So, so the procedure of the uh, uh, log manager to grant logs is that while transaction are executing, transactions are executing, if the transaction realizes it needs to access a specific object or record, let's say record A, it would first request the uh, transaction manager to grant that log to that transaction, right? Either or, in some cases, could it be update, right? Update from a shared log to an exclusive log. That also happens. And then the log manager would just check, hey, whether it has granted this log to other transactions before, right? If no, it grants the log. If, if yes, it has granted before, then it has to block that request. And if the transaction successfully acquired that log, and then, I mean, did, uh, does whatever it needs to do to that record, it finally, um, after it's done, it can release the log, right? And then the transaction, I'm um, sorry, the log manager will just be uh, responsible for updates all the internal metadata, right? To keep track of which transaction is holding which log and which transaction is releasing which log and what log will be free and then grant to other transactions, et cetera. All right? Okay, so come back to the earlier example. So I simplified the uh, T2 transaction a little bit, but just to give you a, a more like, a concrete example on these two types of basic logs. So here, transaction T1, read only write on A, and then read on A again. Transaction T2, only write on A, right? So here, because transaction T1 needs to both read and write on A, it would just uh, request a, uh, uh, a exclusive log on, uh, the, from the log manager, and the log manager granted the log because nobody has held I was held in that log before, right? And then after transaction T1 is done with this um, uh, record A, it can just release this log, right? And then later on, transaction uh, T2 uh, would need to uh, acquire this log, and then log manager granted the log, right? Because transaction T1 already released that log. And then after T2 is done, it can release the log. And finally, right, because uh, T1 only needs to uh, read that record, it uh, doesn't need to, uh, uh, what do you call it? doesn't need to acquire exclusive uh, lock again, right? It only needs, to, only needs to acquire a shared lock. And then after everything finished, it's done, right? So everything seems good so far, right? But there's a, actually a problem happening here, right? So what is the problem? The problem is that transaction T1 Actually, transaction T1 performed two reads on record A, right? It first read it, write it back again, and then read it later. But between the two reads, transaction T2 actually come along and change the value uh, that transaction T1 written before, right? And this is actually an unrepeatable read. Or, I mean, from T1's perspective, it's unrepeatable read. From T2's perspective, it's dirty writes, right? But essentially, I mean, this transaction schedule is incorrect, right? And nothing, I mean, nothing here is really, uh, well, th yeah, there would not be a serial schedule uh, that would produce a result or the effect that's equivalent to this schedule, right? So this is actually wrong. So what does this tell us? This tells us that by simply uh, locking records while you need to access them, that doesn't prevent cycles uh, in the, count, in the, I mean, in terms of uh, cycles in the dependency graph, right? According to our uh, conflict standard uh, in a uh, schedule of the transactions. Right. So even though you do this, you lock records while I mean, you want to access it, if you draw the uh, conflict graph or the dependency graph, there can still be cycles, and this can still be wrong. We need something a little bit uh, better, right? more, com more sophisticated than that. Make sense? Okay. 
yeah, I mean, it just shows that this is wrong. <laughs> okay, so the uh, first uh, fundamental algorithm that we are going to talk about, actually invented a while ago, that helped us to achieve uh, this uh, concurrency control uh, uh, functionality and produce a correct result will be called uh, two-phase locking. Right. Essentially, uh, the thing I would emphasize here is that unlike the analysis that we did uh, last class, right, we assume that we know uh, all the operations and which transaction commit abort in our two-phase locking is uh, actually an algorithm that we implemented in the, in the real system, right? And in real system, you don't really know the schedule in, uh, in ahead of time. You don't really know which transaction committed or abort. So under this uh, mechanism or protocol, it only can decide whether to uh, grant a lock or to, uh, or to ask a transaction to wait for a lock when you are executing them, uh, the, the transaction on the fly, right? It don't really uh, schedule things ahead of time, okay? So, I mean, almost like the name says, under the protocol of uh, two-phase locking, there will be uh, two phases, right? Well, the one phase will be called a growing phase, and the other phase will be called a shrinking phase. And in the growing phase, you only acquire locks, right? And of course, by issuing a lock acquire request to the lock manager. And in the shrinking phase, you only release locks, right? In other words, once you enter the shrinking phase, you cannot acquire any new uh, lock anymore, right? It will make sense uh, when we give you, make more sense when we give you some examples. But here, just again, illustrate uh, what uh, this two phase locking protocol is trying to do, right? Assuming that, I mean, here we illustrate the number of locks in the transaction uh, during the time uh, duration. And uh, in the growth phase, number of locks just keep increasing, right? And in the shrinking phase, the number of locks just keeps de de decreasing, right? Once in the shrinking phase, cannot acquire any new lock again, right? So, for example, here, I mean, if in the shrinking phase, it would uh, assume that it uh, release some lock and then acquire some new lock, this would be uh, considered invalid under the protocol of uh, two-phase locking, all right? So I'll give you a concrete example. <laughs> here, assuming, uh, again, as I, see, I think it's a similar example. It's the same example before, T1 read, write, and read, T2 uh, only write, right? So here, in this case, T1 first enter the uh, growing phase and uh, ask the uh, trans lock manager to grant a uh, exclusive lock and then, I mean, grant it. And T2 here, because T1 is still, op is still operating on the record, right? It cannot release the lock yet. So when T2 trying to acquire uh, this exclusive lock on uh, record A again, it just got denied, right? it has to wait. And then after a while, only when uh, transaction T1 has finished, right, it can finish all the op accessing or operation on record A, it can tell the lock manager, hey, I can release uh, this, uh, my lock now, right? Then lock release, and after that, uh, transaction uh, T2 acquired the uh, lock, exclusive lock on record A, and then after T2 is done, it finishes, right? You can see here in this example, by specifically define the uh, growing phase and the shrinking phase, we actually avoided the uh, earlier uh, problem that happened before, right? The transaction T2 has a write sneaking between two reads from transaction T1, right? Here it doesn't happen. It's like a conflict serializable and this is considered a correct schedule. Make sense? Cool. So, uh, so far so good. But actually this one uh, problem that we uh, that, that, that still can exist, uh, well, all to make this uh, two-phase locking algorithm inefficient, which is that, again, when we, uh, when we analyze uh, the uh, transaction uh, conflicts last class with these uh, different uh, conflicts, we actually always assume that we know uh, which transaction boss, which transaction commits, and we just sort of assume there's a uh, magical algorithm that uh, would uh, eliminate the effect of transactions that have aborted, right? We, when we analyze the conflict last, last class, we only focus on transactions that have uh, committed and then analyze where there will be conflict here. But in actuality, transaction may abort. Right. So under this um, two-phase locking protocol, I mean, it, it can handle abort, a transaction abort, but then when transaction abort, it may have a cascade effect that could affer, affect other transactions and makes the system uh, inefficient. So let me give you an example here, right? <laughs> Again, here, same thing, right? T1 and T2, right? Uh, and uh, I'm assuming that we have uh, two records, A and B, right? So here, 
Yeah, assume, yeah, assuming that uh, T1 is uh, read on A, uh, write on A, and uh, T2 are uh, read on A, write on A, and T1 come back and read on B, write on B, right? Here, in this case, under a two phase locking, right, we could actually uh, start at the T1 with a growing phase, right, lock on A, lock on B, and then uh, after uh, the growing phase is done, we uh, release the lock on, lock on A. Actually, the, the read on B, write on B doesn't really matter here. Like, actually, pretty much ignore this read on B or write on B on the transaction T1, right? But 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 once the transaction T1 release lock on A right finish I mean after it finish accessing a record on A, it can the transaction T2 can come along and read this record right, and then assuming that after that I mean transaction T2 read this record and then do we do some update on that, assuming that after a while transaction T1 abort, then the, the record that is read by transaction T2 is actually invalid right, so the schedule on the left. I mean, satisfies uh, two-phase locking, right? It, it is a growing phase and there's a shrinking phase, right? It, it ensures that, uh, I mean, it doesn't have uh, the conflicts that we talked about before, right? But then if that happened, if transaction T1 abort, transaction T2 has also to be uh, aborted as well, right? Because otherwise, uh, this uh, record read by transaction T2 would be invalid, right? So essentially, here, as you see here, even though uh, two-phase locking would ensure that I mean, at the end of the day, all the committed transactions would satisfy conflict serializability, right? Everything is correct, but when a board happen, right? I mean, if there's a other transaction that has read the record from a aborted transaction, the other transaction has to be aborted in a cascade fashion, right? And this could, could go on, on and on, right? Could be five, 10 transactions if there are lots of conflicts, right? So there will be a lot of work waste if you just use this uh, original version of uh, two-phase locking. Make sense? Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, so, uh, well, yeah, that's essentially uh, what we just talked about uh, here. So uh, the two-phase locking is actually a little bit conservative uh, schedule, right? There are actually uh, certain uh, conflict serializable schedules that, that, I mean, that would not just be allowed by two-phase locking. Again, because two-phase locking doesn't really know the entire schedule ahead of time, right? So it's a little bit conservative, uh, but at the meantime, under two-phase locking, there may still have a dirty reads, at least temporarily, that may make uh, transactions uh, to abort in a cascading fashion, right, which would uh, generate lots of waste work. So the solution for that would be a little bit stronger version of two-phase two locking. There are actually different variants of solutions, but the solution we talk about today in this course would be a, like a pretty strong variant of two-phase locking called strong, strict two-phase locking. And in other words, it, some people also call it rigorous two-phase locking. Uh, that would uh, help to uh, resolve the uh, cascade aborting issue we just talked about. And then there can actually uh, uh, there can be other uh, potential issues, like if different transactions can uh, while well, if different transactions are acquiring locks. Transaction one, for example, acquiring locks on A and B. Transaction two, for example, acquiring locks from B and A. Then there could be deadlocks, right? And we also need to have a mechanism to pro uh, prevent uh, transactions to have deadlocks or to break them up when that happens. So let me uh, first focus on this uh, dirty read problem I just talked about. So the uh, solution I have already uh, mentioned for this will be called strong strict uh, two-phase locking. Right? So in this case, a transaction is only allowed to release uh, locks after it has ended. Right? <laughs> so you can almost think that the, there, the, the, there's a homogeneous shrink phase. Right? The growing phase is the same, right? but the shrink phase has actually just uh, be collapsed together. Right? You just release all the lock at the end of the shrink phase, and then especially at the end of the transaction, either when the transaction committed or uh, aborted. So here, right? So let me let me demonstrate here. So because of I mean historical reason, uh, we still call this uh, uh, protocol two phase locking. But the, but essentially, I mean the 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 second phase is just like a, a, a single point in time, right? When the transaction finished, you release everything. Right? That's just the entire second phase. So uh, definition related to this uh, strong strict. Uh, two-phase locking is a concept called a strict schedule. Right? Essentially, a schedule is a strict if a value written by a transaction is not read or overwritten by any other transactions until that transaction uh, finishes. Right? I mean, you can you can sort of tell how 
strong, strict two-phase locking guarantee that, that, right? Because once you acquire a lock, you never release that lock and until the end of the transaction, right? So just guarantees this uh, strict property uh, of, a, uh, of a schedule. And then again, the advantages of uh, this strong, strict two-phase locking would be that first, it will not uh, incur a cascade aborts. I'll give you some example. And then the second is that when transaction aborts, you, you, you only need to restore the uh, update value for this single transaction as well, right? So when transaction aborts, there will not be, um, again, there will not be cascade operation you have to do to restore uh, values from multiple transactions, right? You only need to deal with this uh, single transaction when abort happens. So uh, let me uh, give you an example here, right? Say here example, uh, I just uh, move, want to move $100 from my account uh, to my promoter's account, right? And then we have another tra this is a transaction one. And then for another transaction, it just sums up the uh, total amount of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, dollars uh, among, uh, from all accounts, right? And this echo here, you can just think of that, I just uh, print that information out, right? So <laughs> under a non two phase locking example, right? What we can have is that, again, back to the earlier example, we can just lock records while we uh, need to ac ac access them. And here, for example, oh, and also right, in the uh, initial state of the database, uh, there could be, uh, uh, I mean, for, for, uh, for the account A, there could be $1,000, account B, there could also be $1,000, all right? So again, in the non phase 2 phase locking example, you just lock records while, I mean, these uh, transaction needs to access them. They first acquire an exclusive lock on A, right? And then when T2 wants to apply a shared lock uh, on, on A, it, it just has to wait, right? But then after a while, T1 can release the lock, and then uh, T2 can have the lock, right, on, on A, and then read the record. <laughs> and then after that, it can lock lock. And after a while, I mean, uh, uh, oh, oh, actually, yeah, after that, and T2 wants to uh, acquire a shared lock on B and grant it, and then later on, T1 has to be blocked, right? And then wait for T2 to release a lock on B, and then finally, uh, T1 can finish as well, right? But in this case, right, because we uh, didn't really follow two-phase locking. So while transaction T2 is reading the record on A, it's actually read a sort of a half-updated value, half-updated value from T1, right? So A is already deducted by 100 by T1 in this case. And then when uh, T2 trying to op op output the summation of the two values, it only output 100, uh, 1,900, right? Which would be incorrect, okay? So under two-phase locking, so there will be a shrinking phase, and then there will be a, sorry, sorry, there will be a growing phase, and there will be a shrinking phase, right? So first, T1 trying to acquire a lock on A, granted, and then T2 has to wait in this case, right? Then it uh, comes back, I mean, T1 can actually uh, acquire lock on B ahead of time, right? Because it has to acquire all the lock uh, in the growing phase. And then after that, when T2 tries to acquire lock on B, it has to wait, right? And then only after a while, when T1 finishes all the, the uh, operation, it can release uh, it can release T1 the record on A earlier, but then it can release the record on B the lock on B uh, later, right? And then uh, in this case, uh, T2 can finally um, acquire the lock on B, and then after it finished the operation, it can release all the locks, right? So here, if we uh, sum everything up, T1 and then T2, well, when they, when they sum up when they sum up the record, the value from A and B, there will be 2,000, right? So in the um, two-phase locking case, uh, this uh, schedule of the transaction would be uh, correct, right? Finally, under the strong, strict uh, two-phase locking, again, the same example, but in this case, T1, while it is like applying uh, uh, rec uh, locks on record A or record B, it just uh, never release lock, right, until the very end of the transaction. I mean, T2 here, similar thing, right? Even though it has to wait uh, for transaction T1 to release all locks, after it acquires locks, it never release everything until the very end of the transaction, when, when right, at, right at when it needs to commit. Right? In this case, there will be just an example of strong, strict uh, two-phase locking, and then there will not, not be a cascade of bars in this case. Make sense? All right, again, it's uh, still correct. Right? A, A plus B would still be a 2000 in this example. So if we uh, get back to uh, our uh, earlier uh, example, uh, 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 earlier diagram of the uh, uh, different uh, category of transaction schedules, here, 
let's say assume that we use uh, this uh, big box to demonstrate uh, to represent all the allow all the possible uh, schedules of a set of transactions then this serial schedule will just be a tiny portion of them right and then uh, beyond that, there will be a conflict serializable, right, to allow you a swap non-conflicting operations. And then beyond that, assuming that you know a little bit of semantics, there will be a view serializable, right, would still be correct, but difficult to do. And then on a different level, right, there could be a set of no cascading aborts uh, transactions, right. I mean, some of them would be serial, some of them may not be serial, right. It's like a different set of um, transaction schedules. But then the overlap of the uh, non-cascade aborts and the uh, serial uh, transaction schedules would be, would be called strong strict uh, 2PL, right. I mean, it can guarantee that transaction schedule is correct, but it's a little bit more conservative than conflict serializable, right? But at the meantime, it also, uh, I mean, don't allow, uh, it don't allow uh, about aborts either, right? So make things a little bit more efficient. Make sense? Any questions so far? Yes, please. So if it's just doing two-phase blocking, not strong strict two-phase blocking, yeah. how do you know when to take the administration phase if you don't like <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, we don't need to go back. Yeah, essentially the question is how do we, under regular uh, two phase locking, how do we know we entered uh, the shrinking phase, right? So that's a very good question. So uh, essentially, that's why in practice, most of the time people actually use a strict, a strong strict two phase locking. Right. Exactly like you said, it's very difficult to know you already entered the shrinking phase unless you get some sort of hint from the users, hey, I will not need new locks anymore, right? or my transaction has ended. Right? It's difficult to know. So yeah, I mean, that algorithm exists uh, in textbook. It's the first developed uh, algorithm in this category of algorithms. Uh, but in practice, people just uh, use, uh, most of the time, use strong strict to phase locking. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, please. Yes. Uh, so that means like uh, every transaction is uh, now varying from a uh, value which is modified as D1 and one of great and then D1 actually comments. If it, if it aborts, then they have to uh, abort that uh, Sorry, I'm not entirely following. Could you, could you repeat again? Yeah. Um, so in the case of regular 2 yes. if a transaction has a return to a value and a decent block of that, yes. so every other transaction which takes shape now uh, to read that value has to wait on D1 committing before they can commit themselves. Yes, yes, they have to wait for T1 to commit before they can commit. That's true. Yes. I, yeah, because they don't know whether T1 will commit or not. If T1 aborts, they have to abort on a regular 2PL. Yes. Yeah, 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 well, is there any benefit? Well, the benefit would be that potentially you can release lock earlier, right? Get more flexibility in your schedule. Uh, but in most cases, people use strong street to be off. Yeah, yeah. Okay, any other questions, by the way? All right, then we talk about uh, I mean, 2PL and strong streak 2PL. We talk about how do we uh, prevent uh, cascade aborts from dirty arrays. And now just to talk about a little bit about, hey, what if there are deadlocks, all right? So uh, let's give you an example. I, again, very simple here. Assume that transaction T1 acquires a lock on A first, right? Because it needs to redirect her on A and T2 comes along and wants to acquire a lock on B because they need to read on B. And then assume that later on T1, uh, T2 needs to read on record A, so it, it wants to acquire the lock on record A, but got denied, right, because it will be held by T1. And then uh, again, assume that T1 later on needs to read or write on record B, so it wants uh, to acquire lock on record B, and it also got denied. Right? So in this case, it's just a deadlock, right? The both of the two transactions will be waitable ever, which is bad, right? We have to address this, otherwise this software just doesn't work, right? So uh, essentially that would be just called a deadlock, and then more specifically, a deadlock just means that there's a cycle in the uh, in the tra different transaction waiting from uh, each other uh, so that, I mean, nobody can really uh, release any lock and nobody can really can, can proceed, right? And essentially, uh, there will be um, 
at high level two types of approaches uh, to deal with deadlocks, right? The one is uh, deadlock detection. Essentially, it's a little bit optimistic. You just let transactions to acquire locks, I mean, in whichever way they want, right? And then if uh, there would be deadlock, if there uh, would be deadlock, then you just try to uh, detect the deadlock and then try to break things up when deadlock happen, right? And then another approach would just be called a deadlock prevention, which is a little bit uh, uh, pessimistic. So essentially, uh, you will assume that I mean deadlock may happen very often. So before a transaction acquire any lock, you check where hey, if I get this lock, whether there will be a possibility that I can generate a deadlock in this different uh, waiting relationship of the transactions, right? If there's such ability, you just uh, I mean either you kill yourself or you kill the other transaction, right? But th that that depends. Uh, but essentially, you try to prevent deadlocks ahead of time, right? So let's talk about a deadlock detection first. Uh, and I will show them some demos related to that. So uh, to uh, implement this uh, deadlock detection algorithm, you actually have to sort of create a wait for graph, right? That's, uh, that's the uh, standard terminology. A wait for graph uh, to keep track of what locks that each transaction is waiting for uh, to acquire. So this um, wait for graph is actually a directed graph. So if a transaction uh, TI is waiting for a transaction TJ to release a lock, then there will be a directed edge, right, from T1, uh, sorry, TI to TJ. And then you just uh, draw all these edges uh, for all the current uh, transactions in your system, and if there's a cycle, then there will be a deadlock, okay? So also the, the way to think about this is that in, in the internal component of the IBS system, there would actually be a background threat, right? So the, the lock manager would keep track of uh, all this kind of metadata, who, which transactions acquire which lock, which is waiting for which, et cetera. And also there will be a background thread that just wakes up periodically, right? To look at, hey, this like a different relationships, different wait for um, relationship between different transactions to check whether there will be cycles, right? And if there's a cycle, the background thread will do something to break things up, all right? So here, in this example, right, T1, T2, or T3, uh, let's just look at just a wait for relationship, right? Uh, here, uh, transaction T1 is waiting uh, for transaction T2 because T1 acquires the lock on B before, right, there's an edge. And similarly, uh, transaction T2 uh, is waiting for transaction uh, T3 to, to release the lock on C, right, because, I mean, again, T3 get a lock before uh, or earlier, and then finally, their transaction T3 is also waiting for a transaction T1 to release the lock on A, right? So there would be a deadlock, and essentially there is a cycle in this uh, wait for graph on the right, right, which we have to break up. It's good? Nice. So uh, the way, again, like I sort of like uh, hinted a little bit earlier, the way we are going to handle this uh, deadlock situation when it happens, it's just that we are going to select a transaction we call victim, and to just kill that transaction, roll it back, and to just to uh, break uh, break up the cycle, right? And uh, this uh, victim transaction could actually choose to either uh, restart or just to abort and, and let the user to handle whatever error message uh, they get, right? Uh, but uh, the the second case, the abort case, is actually uh, more often. Right? Just tell the user and give them uh, the option. Right. And uh, uh, lastly, I mean, as I mentioned before, there is actually a background thread periodically checking it. Right, so there's actually a trade-off. Right, if you checking it very often, then obviously you can detect uh, deadlocks earlier and break things up earlier. But then, I mean, it takes time to build the graph and check the cycles, etc. Right, so it consumes more resource, and then vice versa. Right. So let's talk about how to uh, select this victim. And actually, uh, in fact, there's not really a, a very, how to say, the, most of the time the, the way to select this victim is actually kind of intuitive, right? It's kind of like a, a black art, right? There's no like a sophisticated algorithm to tell you, hey, this is the optimal way to select a victim, right? Because oftentimes this relationship between different transactions are kind of complicated and difficult to know, hey, what is the potential best way? So oftentimes, just people just use heuristics, right? And to kind of give simple rules and make things are easier to handle, easier to implement and efficient, uh, and just uh, they may not be optimal, right? For example, right? In many, in many cases, uh, you can uh, break up the cycles by age, and you can just, uh, uh, I mean, kill the transactions with the oldest age, for example, right? And in this case, the, the intuition would just be that um, the oldest transaction in your system may acquire the most number of locks, right? And then, I mean, if you kill that old transaction, uh, maybe you just release many locks, right? 
and then uh, that potentially give um, better opportunities uh, to uh, prevent deadlocks uh, in, the, in the system. But, but of course, on the other hand, you could also argue that, hey, the old transactions may already do lots of work, right? It's kind of a waste to just kill the transaction that already uh, did a ton of work. So another way to select victim would just be like, hey, look at what would be the transaction that has uh, progressed the most, right? If, if a transaction that has uh, made lots of progress, you don't kill that. On the other hand, you kill a transaction that didn't do much work, right? Because it's, it's cheaper to restart. Or you can also uh, just directly look at the number of locks, right? So another reasoning would be that hey, if a transaction has maybe locked, has required lots of locks, right, then potentially it, it didn't need much time to finish. Right? So maybe it just needs the last one or two locks to finish the entire transaction. So maybe you should let that continue and then kill the other transaction with, I mean, again, similar to progress, right? less progress or less locks, right? Oh, and then there's the other uh, scenario where if you don't use a uh, strong strict to PL, then if you kill one transaction, then that may have a uh, cascade effects, right? The other transactions either read the record, for example, either another transaction read the record that is already written by my current uncommitted transaction, right? If I abort this transaction, the other transaction has to abort, right? So maybe in that case, we just don't abort uh, that transaction. Right? But again, these are all like a heuristics, right? I mean, with some uh, reasoning for each of them, but none of them would, would guarantee an optimal way to break things up, right? Yeah, oh, lastly, uh, the, the, another thing uh, to consider is that we don't want a starvation either, right? So we also need to uh, keep track of the number of times uh, transactions have been aborted or restart, right? If we just uh, keep aborting and restarting a single transaction, we'll probably give that transaction a little bit of priority as well. So uh, there would actually uh, two, let me, let me see. Okay, so I'll finish this slide and then we can uh, see some demo to see that in action, right? So this slide just uh, says that, hey, when a transaction aborts, you actually have uh, two options, uh, or, or different options uh, to decide, sorry, let me take it back. When you select a transaction uh, to be a victim, you actually uh, have uh, options to decide how do you handle uh, that situation. Right? You can either just uh, completely abort that transaction, right? roll everything back, and either tell the user, hey, I mean, this thing goes wrong, I mean, do something uh, with that. Or you can just restart it automatically. Right? Or you can actually try to go back to the transaction uh, query by query to see that, hey, what would be the minimum number of queries that I enroll back within this transaction so that my waitful graph does not have a cycle anymore, right? And then you just roll back the few number of queries uh, up to that, I mean, uh, good point, and then you just uh, continue from there. Right? Hopefully, when things start again, other transactions maybe proceed earlier, and then they can finish earlier, and then uh, the, 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 you won't, will not meet this uh, cycle or dialogue situation again. Okay. Yeah, just uh, two options. So now let me give you some uh, demo uh, on this uh, dialogue detection in action. Cool. Let's see how this works. Can I actually, where is this? Okay, it's here. Okay. Oh, oh I probably should. Yeah, it's actually not very easy for me to see that, but that's fine. Next time I will. Okay, <laughs> so this is uh, MySQ. I have loaded in, right? It's MySQ database, and then it is using uh, that that log detection mechanism to, uh, I mean, ensure that uh, that the dialog can uh, be break up and proceed. And then in this uh, MySQL database, right, I have uh, created a uh, table called the transaction demo, and then there are two uh, values in that table, right? Just, uh, let me, yeah, select that again, right? Can, or I can see that, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, then uh, this, uh, the, the yeah, value one with, a value, uh, with ID, record one with value 100, and record two, right, ID two with uh, value 200, okay? So, let me just to make sure that uh, this this uh, deadlock detection mechanism mechanism is on, right? So here, let me use to command. Okay, well, the first command, right? As you can tell, hopefully, uh, I, 
I don't know who people in the back can see it or not, right? Hopefully you can see it. Uh, the first command, we set the uh, InnoDB deadlock detection is on, right? It, by default it's on, but just make sure. And second, right, we set the uh, global uh, uh, deadlock detection wait time uh, to be 50 seconds, right? And here, sorry, I'm going to start two transactions. Okay. Oh, I probably, uh, let's, let's, I probably started uh, two times, right? So let's just start it again. Okay, I set the uh, session uh, isolation level to be serializable, right? And then we begin a transaction, right? And then I will do the same thing here, right? In the second terminal, right? I begin a transaction as well, right? Okay. Oh, this is actually going slow. And next time I should bring another laptop, actually. Mm. So what we'll do here is that we'll have a uh, first uh, transaction right, to do a update on the first value, right? ID equals to Y. And then we come back for the uh, second transaction We'll do a update, right, on the uh, ID equals two, right? Make sense? And then we come back. We oh, actually then we can directly come back to the first transaction, right? We can do a update equals two. Actually, oh, actually, yeah. Sorry, yeah. The second case, I haven't selected the database. Shit, let me commit this, right. Oh, this is not easy. Okay, use demo. Start from, okay, now we are good. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me just make sure that I committed everything and uh, come back. I start this uh, transaction again. We can set the actual level, begin, and then we, uh, oh, oh, actually, ah. yeah, because because we already uh, select trans I, uh, two pause from the second transaction, right? So that uh, while it is uh, it is executing, it's it's actually uh, still holding some logs, right? So that blocks my transaction on the on the first uh, demo. Let me try to, yeah, after I commit this, right, you can see the first transaction also uh, go through, right? Makes sense? But that's, that's not exactly what I wanted to show, but uh, essentially uh, that's, 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 I mean, the effects of deadlock detection algorithm, right? So uh, let me just uh, quickly uh, go back to this. Right, let me make sure that this thing is also committed. Okay. And let me uh, start this again. Right, you can see uh, this first transaction uh, goes through successfully, right? It is looking at records on uh, ID equals to one. And then the second transaction, right? Right, also goes through successfully, right? But it's looking at the record on ID equals to two. And then come here, if we come back to the first transaction, right? You see, if we issue a uh, record on ID uh, equals two, then, sorry, issue a query on ID equals two, it is waiting, right? Because the second transaction already acquired the lock, right? So now, this is what I actually want to show. If we come back to the second transaction, right? And then we do a change 
on ID equals to one, right? What happened here? What happens is that the system automatically detects that there's actually a deadlock, right? And then we set the deadlock de detection uh, timeout to be 50 seconds because of all the hassle is well above 50 seconds. And uh, the transaction, the second transaction, once it issues this uh, query, it already formulate a deadlock uh, in this like a simple relationship, right? And the system detects that and it breaks that transaction up and then uh, just uh, directly kill that transaction, right? Because it says deadlock found and then try restart. And then the first transaction on the top, we can see that it goes through successfully, all right? Yeah, cool. So now, <laughs> let me uh, give you an example on uh, Postgres, all right? To see how things are uh, doing there. So here, similarly, right, it's the same table, right, uh, two records, one and two, and then one is on, uh, one record is on, um, one record has ID one by 100, the other ID two by 200, right? Let me select this again to make sure that I'm on the correct database. Okay, I'm in the correct database, nice. So here, let me uh, set, again, it's a, there's a deadlock timeout. Let's just set it to be a little bit fast, right? That will make sure that we don't need to uh, wait for too long to see the result. And similar thing, right? For the first transaction, we're going to, uh, I mean, first begin the transaction, of course, and then uh, access the uh, record with the ID equals to one, all right? And similar here, come back to my commands. On the second transaction, right, we've accessed the um, record with ID equals to two first, right? Then let's come back to the first database, right? X2 again, right? Again, it's actually uh, got blocked here because transaction two is accessing uh, the uh, the same record and already got the lock, right? Finally, if we come back to uh, this transaction, sorry, yes. And then when we uh, get this, um, this, this trying to access the uh, record with ID, ID equals to one, then it just got blocked, right? Because there's a deadlock situation. And then, yeah, after a few seconds, right? Remember we have set the deadlock timeout to be 10 seconds, right? And then after uh, 10 seconds, it would recognize, hey, there's a deadlock. And then what's interesting here is that it actually shows you which transaction is uh, causing this deadlock, right? Who is waiting on, on who and what type of lock it is getting, right? It shows a share lock here. I think it's because I, think it's because I believe it, it, that when it is executing this query, it first try to read that record first, right? So it will try to acquire a shared lock first. But it, of course, eventually it need to in a ex ex exclusive lock. But because the other transaction got an exclusive lock, it cannot get a shared lock. Right? And, but it just tells you which transaction is blocked on which, and then, uh, I mean, uh, why it is uh, aborted right? because of this deadlock reason. So the next thing I actually want to show you a little bit is that there's actually internally, I can show you that how a Postgres is uh, tracking all this uh, information. They actually have a specific table. You can actually uh, access uh, this um, dependency information of different transactions, right? To see how they are internally maintain this and try to detect this. So to do that, actually, let me um, just uh, try to commit everything. Oh, it's a road back, right? Because it, um, it, it, uh, it uh, got aborted. Let me just try to commit this thing as well. Committed? Okay. Yeah, there's no transaction in progress. Okay. Yeah. Another thing I just want to point out is that when I'm trying to commit this transaction here, right, it doesn't allow me to commit, right? Because it says it already wrote back, right? Just a thing to point out. So here, what I want to show you is that I want to set the, uh, wait a second set the timeout time to be a little bit longer, right? For example, to be uh, 300 seconds. 
right, just uh, arbitrarily long. Okay. Hmm? Uh, I don't know. Oh, sorry, I accidentally copied the wrong command, sorry. Here. Okay, set the timeout to be 300 seconds. And then again, we do the same thing, right? We do, uh, actually, I think I can just uh, directly find the earlier command from here, right? Begin the first transaction, the second transaction, right? The second transaction uh, access record T2 first, right? And then we go up. You begin the uh, first transaction. The first transaction would access record T1 first, right? And then we let the first transaction access T2, and then we let the second transaction to access T1. Oh, it goes through. What I did wrong this time. Actually, well, I mean, I don't know what I did wrong this time, but I didn't got a block. Maybe I just uh, messed up the commit history or anything. I don't think I have time to go through this again, but essentially, right, uh, in Postgres internally, they will have this uh, a table to specifically track of different relationship between these uh, transactions, right? And you can access that table and to look at which transactions is, is, is waiting on which. And that's what Postgres use to formulate the uh, dependency graph and uh, detect that logs and break things up. All right, cool. Next time, I think I will probably use a different laptop to set this up, right? This is not very easy to present. Oh, sorry, this I should. Uh... Okay, any questions so far? on the demos on uh, deadlock detection to phase locking. Okay. <laughs> then for the rest of time, we talk a little bit about a different uh, mechanism called deadlock uh, prevention. Also uh, trying to uh, address this deadlock issue. And then we give a little bit of heads up on hierarchical locking, all right? So we talk about this one way uh, to address the lock is, again, to let transactions to acquire locks as they want, and then break things up when there's a cycle, right, when there's deadlock. But then another way to, to achieve this is that we can actually, uh, before the transaction acquire any lock, we check whether there will be a possibility, right? There's this uh, lock acquisition would cause a deadlock, right? If there is, then we just uh, directly uh, release Oh, sorry, we do something accordingly, right? Either kill this transaction or kill the transaction that is already held in lock, okay? So that will be called the log prevention. And this will not require this uh, waitfall graph or background checking, et cetera, we talked about earlier when we, are, we have the deadlock detection mechanism. Make sense? So in deadlock de prevention uh, uh, mechanism, we actually assign priority to transactions based on their uh, timestamps. Right. So we actually always assign higher priority to the transactions that have a higher uh, timestamp, essentially the older, uh, older transaction. And we do this uh, because we won't, don't want starving. Right. So we can see that essentially while well, we are killing transactions, uh, sometimes some the transaction gets started, but we always keep the original uh, timestamp uh, of the transactions, even though we start at the transaction again. So in that case, we always ensure that uh, at some point, a specific transaction has become the oldest transaction in the system and has the highest priority so that it can proceed, right, but not be killed. And essentially, there are two uh, different schemes uh, to achieve this deadlock of prevention, depending on uh, you want, depending on you want which, trans which, which type of transaction to wait, to wait on which type of transaction. Otherwise, otherwise, to say that depending on which you are going to kill. So the first uh, scheme is called a uh, wait die, or essentially we only allow the old transactions to wait for the uh, younger transactions. So essentially, when uh, if a younger transaction want to compete or acquire a log that is already held 
by an older transaction, we wouldn't, that, wouldn't allow that to happen, right? We'll kill the younger transaction right away, right? That's called wait to die, right? If a younger transaction, if it's a younger transaction, it doesn't allow to be waiting, right? It has to die, right? And then on the other hand, it's called wound wait. So it will be that we only allow younger transactions uh, to wait for the old transactions, right? Only allow that one single direction of wait. So another way to look at it is that when a old transaction want to acquire a lock that is already held by a younger transaction, we'll give a priority to the old transaction. So we'll kill the other transaction, the younger transaction that is already waiting, right? So we only allow younger wait for old, but if we old trying to um, wait for young, trying to acquire a lock that's already held by young, we wouldn't allow that waiting to happen. We'll just kill the other younger transaction right away. That makes sense? Okay, so in this case, again, give a little bit of heads up. What we want to achieve is that we want, we want, we want there would only be one direction of waiting right, among all the, other, all the transactions, right? So if we, again, we could draw the weight graph here, but even though we don't draw it, right, the potential weight graph would be guaranteed no cycle, right? Because there's only be one uh, direction of edges in the hypothetical weight graph, even though we don't actually need to compute it, right? Because we don't need to detect that deadlocks here. That makes sense? Okay. So here, to so give you an example, right? Here, T1, T2, uh, in, the, in the example above, assume that uh, T1 acquire this, uh, this exclusive lock, and then uh, on AA, oh, sorry, assume T2 acquired the lock first, and then T1 as a older transaction now wants to acquire this lock, right? So first, under uh, the weight die scheme, right, because uh, T1 is older, Right, it is actually allowed to wait, right? In this case, older transaction always waits for younger, right? But if you are going to use a wound wait scheme, right, because T1 is trying to acquire a lock on T2, but older transaction is not allowed to wait for younger transaction, we'll kill T2 right away, okay? On the other, I mean, example, it was the opposite direction, right? Here, T2, as a younger transaction, is trying to acquire a lock that is already held by T1, which is an older transaction. So here, in this case, in the wait die case, right, we wouldn't allow a younger transaction to wait for older transaction, so we'll abort uh, T2 right away. But in wound wait case, right, we'll allow younger transaction to wait for older transaction, right? There's a one direction edge, so we can allow T2 to wait, right? And then hopefully, I mean, T1 can release the lock at some point and things can continue. All right, very easy. So, uh, yeah, I sort of already explained this. So why do these uh, schemes guarantee no deadlocks? Well, because there's only one type of direction, right, allowed in this hypothetical weight graph of these transactions, even though we don't need to generate the weight graphs. And when a transaction starts, what will be the priority? Right, so it is the original timestamp, right? We will transaction you start because we don't want things to start, right? We will guarantee that if you start enough times, right, at some point at a time, you'll always be the oldest transaction in the system, so you have the highest priority, right? So you, do, you don't start forever, all right? Any questions on deadlock uh, prevention mechanism? Okay, no question, cool. So for the uh, remaining time, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, a heads up on the, on the uh, hierarchical locking, even though we don't really have uh, time to finish it today. So uh, here, what we observe is that, so, so far we will talk about these locks, right? We only talk about uh, a one-to-one -one mapping from a lock to a record uh, on a database, right? We will talk about ABC, I mean, et cetera, right? That's the notion of record that we use. But actually, so in actuality, right, a transaction may, for example, read the entire table, right? And the entire table may have a billion records, right? In that case, for the uh, transaction, uh, uh, I mean, protocol or concurrency control protocol we talked about so far, it will just need to acquire one lock on each of the individual uh, billion records, right? So that would just be very time consuming and it's actually much more expensive than acquiring latches when you scan, for example, a B plus tree. Because for this, you can see no matter whether it's deadlock detection or deadlock prevention, you have to go to the lock manager, right? Check who is waiting for this, uh, the lock of this record, whether this will already be held or not, right? In some cases, you need to generate this dependency graph or in other cases, you have to go back to see, hey, to, to determine uh, which transactions already have the lock and 
who to kill, etc. Right. So acquiring lock is actually a much more expensive uh, than latches. And then if you if a trade for a transaction needs to read a billion uh, records, then acquiring a billion uh, locks would be very very expensive. Right. So another way to do this is that hey maybe we can acquire locks at a higher level. Right. So if I know that a transaction would need to acquire locks on the would need to read this entire table, right? Acquire logs on the entire table, sorry, read the records from the entire table and acquire logs for individual records. Then why not instead, I just have a giant lock, right? That I can just lock the entire table, whether it's either read or write, right? And then we only need to acquire this one single lock on the entire table without going through each individual record, right? This would save lots of log acquisition time. But the problem also obvious, right? Here, if you only have a table level or database level of logs, then every transaction have to lock either the entire table or entire database, right? The simplest lock would just be the entire database. You just lock the whole thing. Then it's just back to the case, back to the original case where you only allow one transaction to be executed at a single time, right? So given this, we can see that there's a trade-off between coarse grain locks and then finer grain locks, right? In terms of the flexibility, you allow different schedules as well as the um, actual uh, lock acquisition overhead. So to uh, balance those trade-offs, to uh, find a sweet spot, that's why uh, we introduced the um, concept of hierarchical locking, right? So we have locks at different levels that cooperate with each other. And that's what um, most system will do. At least like a mature system will do. So, uh, I mean, again, so uh, this, uh, to reiterate uh, this concept we talk about, we transaction or acquire a log, it can decide what will be the granularity of that log, right? Has the opportunity to decide whether it's an entire table, entire database, or individual uh, tuple. And what we want is that we want the transaction uh, to acquire fewest number of logs possible, right? To, uh, to achieve the operation that it needs to do. But in the meantime, we want the log to be as fine-grained as possible. Right, so that we don't want uh, to this transaction to block other transactions that they don't need to block. Right, so uh, this is really that's a trade-off between parallelism versus uh, overhead. So here to use this a little bit, right? Let's say we have a transaction uh, T1 that come along that wants to uh, access the uh, all the tuples in the entire table. Right, so here instead of I could directly uh, lock the all the tuples, right? It can just, uh, I mean, as a dice drum draw here, it can just acquire a big log on this table A, right? So that it could just already have the exclusive access. Or alternatively, right? It can choose to log the all the tuples, right? In this in this in this table, that will obviously be more expensive. But on the circumstance that uh, T1 only needs to access one or two tuples it will also be, um, allow more flexible scheduling for other transactions, right? Similarly, it can also acquire even, uh, acquire logs even on individual attribute level, right? So how do we uh, balance those logs in the entire system, right? If we have the opportunity to acquire logs at just a different level, especially with different uh, categories, right? Either can be shared, either can be read, right? There's like lots of options we can choose here. So the way to address that, to make different logs at different levels to coordinate with each other, will be called intention logs, right? It's kind of like a, a tryout uh, log, or it's kind of like a log you acquire, but give other people a heads up of what, what you want to do, right? So essentially, an intention log allows a higher level node on the kind of like a database object tree we talked, we, I showed you earlier, uh, to be logged in either share, shared or exclusive mode uh, without having to lock all the uh, descendants, right? So on the other hand, if a node is locked on intention mode, uh, then some other transaction is actually, uh, some transactions can actually do uh, explicit lock at a lower level of the tree, right? So let, let me give you uh, some specific definition, right? So here we have three types of intention locks, okay? So the first type will be called intention shared, okay? So this is trying to say that, hey, I'm, uh, the, my transaction may acquire, or, or will all acquire the, a shared log at a, a lower level of this node, right? It's an explicit share log, uh, uh, but for the for the other um, uh, uh, nodes, I mean, at a lower level, it, it may not be acquired log, or it's not it's not um, what's it called? It's not exclusive either, right? And then the second called intention exclusive, right? It will indicate that there will be a explicit locking at a lower level of this node with exclusive logs, right? 
So that just to give you give other people a heads up that hey, this node is not entirely locked, right? But some children of this node is locked in the exclusive node, exclusive mode, right? So this just tells other people or give other people a heads up. You see that hey, even though my node is not entirely locked, either shared or exclusive, but there will be some a node uh, down below like, that is uh, either shared or exclusively locked by my transaction. What, how this is useful, right? For example, if one transaction uh, does not need the entire lock on the big node, but only acquire a, for example, a exclusive uh, intention exclusive lock at a lower level on a specific leaf node, then other transaction would know that, hey, I cannot acquire either a shared lock or a exclusive lock on the higher level node. Right, so this, this gave other people a hint of what kind of higher level lock they may, uh, they may, they may request. Does that make sense? Well, I will give you some examples, hopefully in the next class, but uh, here I will just talk about, uh, give you a heads up on the definition. And then I'll show you uh, how, what, what kind of lock are compatible with each other. And again, for the last definition, there will be a type called a shared plus intention exclusive lock, which will mean that my current transaction acquired a shared lock on the entire node, right? Assuming that my node is a table, then this last type of lock would tell me that the current transaction acquired a shared lock on the entire table. But in the meantime, down below this node, there could be either one or a few leaves that has been acquired with exclusive lock, right? So they would just tell other people that, hey, I mean, even though I'm only reading this entire table, you may be able to read some other uh, nodes uh, uh, not from other leaves, right, below, uh, or, uh, yeah, below this table, but you cannot acquire either a shared or exclusive log on the entire table anymore, right? But on the other hand, for example, if I hold a shared intention exclusive log on a table, then other people can still hold either intention shared or intention exclusive, right? Because now the intention shared or intention exclusive will specify that it needs to, needs to have access on all the records uh, on this table. Sorry, it can hold, sorry, it can hold intention shared, it cannot hold intention exclusive anymore, right? So again, back up the example, if one transaction holds this um, shared intention exclusive lock, right? That means that my transaction have shared access on all the tuples, right? But then I, I, I have also have exclusive access on a few tuples down below, right? So this is compatible with intention shared because intention shared does not need any, does not need the entire access on the entire table. It only needs access, the shared access on a few uh, leaves down below this table, right? So this, this is compatible with this uh, shared in intention inclusive log on the entire table. But it's not compatible with this because the, the not compatible with the intention exclusive log because the shared intention exclusive log would have shared log on the entire table, right? That means that any leaf below this table cannot be acquired a exclusive log anymore, right? Because, I mean, the whole, there's already a shared access on everything. So uh, this would just be the, uh, the um, graph, the compatibility matrix uh, for all these uh, types of logs, right? We can see that for the last type of log, right, this kind of exclusive log, then nothing really can be shared, right? I mean, if you have exclusive lock on a specific uh, tuple, then, I mean, there's no other uh, things uh, can be acquired, either on this tuple or on the higher level nodes above this tuple, let's say table or database. But for some other intention locks, right? For example, intention shared, it can actually be compatible with most of the other locks uh, in the table, right? So uh, that's for today, right? In the, in the next class, I will give you uh, more examples on the uh, specific protocols on how to use these shared locks uh, in collaboration with the original two types of basic locks we talked about earlier, and I'll give you examples on how this exactly uh, perform, right? I see.
Jay, talking about the St. Ives brew, run through a can or two, share with my crew is magnificent, plus it's mellow, and for the rest of the commercial, I pass the mic on to my no fellow. for a mic check, bust it, the fuse all set, then grab a 40, to put him to yoga, snap his neck, St. Ives, take a sip, then wipe your lips, cue my 40's getting warm, I'm out, he got the dip, drink it, drink it, drink it, then I burp, after I slurp, ice cube, I put in much work, with the BMT and the E-Trouble, get us a St. Ives brew on the double. 